Our next speaker is Simon Stolichek. He is a fourth year graduate student at the Department of Mathematics under the advisement of Dr. Kresimir Yosik. When he isn't spending an irresponsible amount of time watching TV, those are his words, not mine. Uh, Simon likes to think about what math can tell us about the ways groups interact. Today, he will share with us how he goes about doing that. Allow me to introduce Simon. Whenever I tell somebody that I'm studying math, the first thing they usually end up asking me is, so what do you actually do? My short answer to this is I problem solve. But unfortunately, that leaves them with the impression that I calculate arduous derivatives all day, or worse, that I spend my time multiplying really large numbers together. That's not what I mean by problem solving. Problem solving starts with a tough question. How do people make decisions in groups? Then you break that question into simpler questions like, how do people arrive at a consensus? Or how does information travel through a group? And what affects how it travels? But even those are difficult questions. So then you ask a really simple question. How many jelly beans are in this jar? How many jelly beans would you say there are if you don't actually get to look at the jar, but you only get to ask people who did look what they thought about the amount in the jar? As a mathematician, I have a useful trick for approaching these sorts of problems. No, not staring at 20th century art for inspiration. I mean abstraction. Taking a problem and simplifying it down to its most basic elements. What you lose in the description of a real life complex situation you can often more than make up for by having something more tractable to work with and more transparent that will allow you to actually see what's driving the problem. So we want to think about how people make decisions in groups. Thus, the first thing that we need to abstract is people. How can we simplify complex, emotional, chemical beings that are just infinitely complex and difficult to discern? Points. People are just points. All right, now that I have my people points, how can I signify that they have some sort of relationship? They could be talking, they could be friends. Well, I'll just draw a line between two of them. A line between two points signifies that those two people have some sort of relationship. So those two have a relationship, and so do those two. And when you look at the population as a whole, you get something like this. This picture, a bunch of points with lines in between various pairs, is exactly what we call a network. This particular network is, has points representing characters from the show Mad Men, with a line between two points if those characters had a relationship where one made some sort of advance on the other. So what we get is we, we simplify the complex relationships that happen in almost 100 hours of television to a crisp, clean picture. Now to a network that we should all be highly familiar with, Facebook. Here are all the points represent a fairly popular person's friends, and you connect two points of the line if those two people are also friends with each other. Now this is a pretty picture, but 400 friends with various lines in between them really clutters things up, and it's hard to get any useful information from this. This is where abstraction is very useful again, because you can abstract something more than once. So we can take all this information about points and lines between some of the pairs and transfer that to a matrix, basically some list of ones and zeros denoting the presence or absence of connections. Well, computers are great with this, and we can develop algorithms to tell us useful things about networks. We can also redraw the picture using this information. So we can ask things like, how are people more naturally grouped? And once we use this second layer of abstraction, we can see that people group up into clusters and that higher levels of clustering indicate that those people are actually a group in real life. So in this picture, you can see a person's high school friends, their college friends and coworkers, along with that pair at the bottom that represents that, ca that couple they met at that cafe that one time. So we can do other things with this abstraction method. We can ask questions like, what's the most important point? What's the most highly connected? Why would that be useful to know? Well, that's precisely how the first successful search engines worked. What you would do is enter in your keywords, like cheap costume ideas, 
and the server would bring up all the websites relating to that topic. These websites become the points of our network, and we connect two of these points if one website links to another. And the idea is that more important websites will have better connections to other websites, and they'll be more central in the network. So we go from something nebulous like what's the most relevant website to something very clean and clear that a computer can do in a fraction of a second. So let's go back to our original question. How many jelly beans are in this jar? Well, using our network tool set, we'll first draw five points representing the people who first get to look at the jar. So they look at it, and they make a guess about how many jelly beans are in there. And if you got to ask them yourself, the best guess that you could make would be just to take these numbers and average them together. But unfortunately, like in real life, things won't be so easy for you. You'll have a group of people who we represent with five or four more points who are obstructing this flow of information. And so now we have lines from the top layer to the second indicating that these people tell these new group, this new group what their estimate was. And just like you, these people want to make their best possible estimate, so they'll simply average these numbers together to make their guess. And so now your job is to take these averages, along with knowledge of how they got the numbers, but not the numbers themselves, and try to recover that best guess as if you got to ask that first group yourself. Now the question is, can you always do this? In a perfect world, you'd be able to easily untangle things and find some clever way to order these averages. But unfortunately, we don't live in a perfect world. Why? Some people talk too much. So in this case, that second person is communicating their estimate in such a way that no one can hear his neighbor's estimates without also incorporating his say. So what that does for you is now you can't weigh these averages in any way in order to get back your original estimate. You'll always be overcounting that blabbermouth. So this took us from a difficult question about what gets in the way of our making good estimates and again gives us a clear pictorial representation of that. Now, estimating the amount of jelly beans in a jar is pretty low stakes, but this has applications, which is a benefit of abstraction, to many other situations, like driving, in which the stakes are much higher. So when you're driving, you usually don't see the obstacles in front of you. You're often just reacting to people who are, in turn, reacting to other people. And being able to tell that even if we have perfect drivers, that it matters who looks at whom can affect the safety of your road conditions is a benefit of being able to take something complex and abstract it to a nice picture. And that's what I mean by abstraction, and that's what I mean by problem solving, though I do take the occasional derivative. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>